We've got another special edition of The Sewing Report. My sewing buddy, Denise Wild, is here. She is a sewing and crafting genius. We're going to chat with her. Welcome to The Sewing Report. I'm Jennifer Moore, helping you discover your love of sewing. And with me right now is Denise Wild, our Canadian friend and resident sewing and crafting expert. Denise, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be joining you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and I'm really happy to be here. Me your too. Are amazing. So this is awesome oh. to be here and seeing all your viewers and um, just getting to chat with you more about all the things that we love. So Denise and I met, I'm, I'm not even sure how, oh, I think I had found your website um, and I'd reached out to you to ask if, um, you know, I could link to you guys on, link to your site for my site and we just started talking. So yeah. Denise, uh, how did you originally get into sewing in the first place? Um, well, my, so my family's always sewn. My mom sewed, my grandma sewed, and it's something that I've always been around. Uh, but it wasn't until I was 13 and my dad, um, he traded services with somebody once for a summer. I think he might've built something or done their taxes or something like that. And, uh, the lady came and taught me to sew. So every week she would come over and she helped me with a pattern. So we went to the fabric store together. We pre-traded our fabric together. She taught me how to cut everything. And at the time, this is, I'll date myself, but we did um, a brown plaid button-down shirt, which was very cool at the time, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, but I just, like, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. And I basically didn't stop sewing. And I just wanted to do nothing but sew ever since then. Like, it just brings me so much joy. I love doing it. I love teaching others to do it. Um, so that's kind of, that's how I got started in sewing. Oh, and um, now you eventually went on to found a sewing school, correct? Yeah. So my background is in magazine editorial. I was working for the largest fashion magazine in Canada at the time called Flair. And now actually Flair just this year, either just this year or last year, they went down to digital only, which is so sad. My magazine world is dying. But um, so I was working at Flair at the time. I was kind of known as the girl who sewed. I would always sew my own clothes. I started sewing for others. And then people started asking me to teach them how to sew. And I thought, you know what? I would love to teach sewing classes once I'm, you know, retired, when I'm an old lady, maybe I can teach sewing classes in my basement. And as soon as that thought came into my head, it just wouldn't leave. I thought, you know what? I really do want to teach sewing classes. And um, uh, I thought maybe I'll try and get a part-time job at a local fabric store or actually, I guess that was kind of the only option at the time, a fabric store. But then I thought, well, no one's going to hire me because I'm a magazine editor. I was always going to events or traveling or whatever. I basically didn't have a proper schedule. Like my schedule, my work always ran into evenings and weekends. So I thought nobody's going to hire me. And I thought, well, maybe I can just teach classes out of my place. And I was living in a one bedroom apartment, downtown Toronto at the time. And uh, I was kind of chat, uh, casually chatting with a girlfriend of mine who I told her this idea that I wanted to sew once I was retired in my basement. And I said, you know what? I actually think I want to teach now. And she said, well, actually my friends and I are wanting to learn how to sew and I'm in charge of finding out where. So if you want to teach classes, we'll be your first student. And I was like, that's it. I put together a program. Uh, it was like an eight week program. They came over with their sewing machines. Uh, they brought their sewing machines to my coffee table, my dresser, like we had sewing machines everywhere. And we went through, oh my gosh, sorry. I thought I oh, don't my... worry about it. Don't worry about it. Hey, you sure know what? We're that. a little more casual here at the sewing report. So don't worry. <laughs> um, anyway, so I taught her and her friends. I taught some coworkers. Then strangers started calling me up. You taught my cousin. You taught my neighbor. Da, da, da. Um, next thing you know, I had to move to a commercial location. I was hiring staff. I had three locations in Toronto. I had 3,000 square feet in Manhattan. And um, then eventually I sold the company. So while I was building um, the sewing studio, I was still working in magazines. Um, and then it came to a point, actually, I remember when I was in 
New York opening the studio. I was working part-time for a South Asian magazine and I called my boss and I was like, I love doing this and I want to do it forever, but I just can't, I just have no more time. So there was a point where I couldn't juggle the two anymore. Um, I eventually sold the company to f and Media, which was the largest craft publisher in the world at the time. I think they're probably still the largest craft publisher, but the whole publishing industry has changed so much. Who, who knows what's, hap what's happening? Um, and now I do um, TV. I do a lot of, a lot of daytime TV, um, talking about sewing, spreading the love of sewing and crafting. Um, I do some brand representation and my husband and I um, started a company as well where we go into elementary schools and we do sewing workshops. So we bring in 15 to 30 sewing machines. We bring in four or five instructors and we teach the entire school one grade at a time how to sew. It's so much fun. And, you know, of course, we're passing on a great skill, you know, and, um, a, you know, an everyday life skill that people should know. But also we're spreading the love of creativity. You know, I just I know that you feel the same way, too, like making something with your hands just makes you feel so good. It's kind of my Zen, my happy place. And we're using that to, uh, in, from a mentorship perspective, to help build confidence in kids, um, to help them focus on mindfulness, self-regulation. And, you know, with sewing, the great thing about sewing and any craft is um, there are no wrong answers, right? You know, when mm -hmm. the kid is creating and doing something creative, they're making something with their hands, they don't feel intimidated. They feel liberated. So, you know, put 40 kids in a gym class or in a math class or in an art history class and a good portion of the kids might feel uncomfortable or, you know, whatever it is, their, um, their abilities, their, their body type, their, um, you know, mental capabilities or their, their social economic um, uh, level, they just might not feel comfortable in that environment, but you put them in an art class or a sewing class, and all of a sudden, everyone is succeeding, everyone's making a project, everyone's feeling great about themselves, it's really nice. And uh, what, do you feel like that's the key to get younger people to sew, is getting them at an earlier age like that? Yeah, well, you know, definitely getting them started earlier, but also seeing the possibilities. I think one of the things with my generation especially was a lot of our mothers didn't pass that skill mm -hmm. on to us because they were like, you have to go to college. Like sewing is something that you only do if you can't afford clothes. Like that's when, like that was their mindset that, you know, that sewing, you, you sewed if you were poor or because you had to. So they wanted us to become lawyers, become doctors, go to university. And that whole art and all those domestic skills kind of bypassed us. And now us and the younger generations are saying, wait, we're so connected all the time. You know, we're on social media or on the computer or we're, you know, in robot mode at work. People need that creative outlet. They need to make something with their hands. And then of course the basic life skill of being able to sew on a button or hem your pants or fix a, something in your curtains. You know, a lot of people don't have that. So I think, um, showing ki teaching kids young, but also showing them that there's a world of possibilities. You're not sewing because you can't afford yeah. to buy clothes in the store. You know, you're sewing to create something cool. If you're making clothes, you're, all of a sudden making clothes that fit you or making them in the style that you want. Um, you can do it as a business. You can, uh, you know, do it to repair things around your house. And that's such a misconception. I think everyone assumes that if you sew, you're doing it to save money. Right. And that's not usually the case. As oh, we know, as we know you can, sp I mean, sewing can be kind of expensive. Um, and I would definitely think of sewing in some aspects as almost a lux like a luxury activity. You totally. know, you, have, you know, Fast sewing fashion. machines cost money, fabric costs money, and it's not cheaper than buying your clothes at a store. Totally. It depends on what you're buying and what you're usually spending on your clothes, but I agree completely. And the time involved, you know, it does take a lot of time, which is a very precious commodity for us these days. But, but that's why, you know, finding the, the, the pleasure in it and the joy and the relaxation in it, there's so much more to sewing than, than what there was to our parents. Than just the economy that it, that it yeah. used to be. No, I totally agree. And now what kind of uh, 
like, what do you think interests kids about sewing? Like you said, you know, again, it's a chance to be creative. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of brands are trying to figure out how to reach younger people yeah. or reach younger men and women. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's something that it seems like on a larger scale, we haven't been able to really figure out yet. Um, but it's something that everyone wants to know how to do. Yeah. I would say with kids, like it's really important to have them su succeed in a project right away. So, you know, uh, what we're used to sewing, we're used to making garments that we work on over the course of days, weeks, months, depending on how much time you're putting into it and how complicated it is. But with kids, they need to sew something and have a finished project. And they love seeing stuff come together. And all of a sudden you've got two you know, dimensional pieces of fabric and you've turned them into a three-dimensional creation that you can wear or use or play with. Um, so I think that that tangibility is really good, but also reinforcing that it's quick, it's easy, you get a finished prod product out of it. So, you know, if you're teaching kids to sew or if you want them to sew with your project, like get them to do something fast, fast and complete. And then they're like, yes, I did it. I want to do it. What kind of projects would you recommend for either kids or adults who are just starting out? What kind of projects might be good for them? Um, so for adults, for, for sure, I always say start with a skirt. Even if you do not wear skirts, I always recommend that people start with skirts. Um, actually, let me back up before that. If you're a brand, brand, brand new to sewing, then I would start with like craft projects, whether it's a pillow, a zippered pouch, um, a drawstring bag, like square, like, you know, straight lines, two pieces of fabric, put those together, make something small, and then work bigger from there. I think that's the biggest thing. If you have really high ambitions, you're like, I'm just learning to sew and I want to sew a stretch dress with like a sheer bottom <laughs> and a bustier top. You're like, uh, no, that's not going to work for you. So I think for sure with anybody, whatever age, start small, simple, don't assume that you'll be able to make whatever you want and just, you know, have that success and then move on to something bigger. So for adults, you know, craft, small craft projects, small things, um, then building up it when you're getting into garments, the skirt has to be the first one. Mm -hmm. It's easy to fit, easy to make, you know, simple things, but then you're getting all that garment making techniques. So we've, we've talked about this before. Um, cause did you and I chat pretty frequently there are yeah, a lot of, there, enough, I want to talk to you all the time. I know there are a lot of like YouTube channels and blogs that, that kind of, they, they have projects like the five minute crafts projects and some of them don't seem super practical. And sometimes it's kind of, uh, um, interesting to see, but, uh, Jenna Marbles, who's a huge YouTuber, uh, just put out a video recently where she tries out some of these crafts and yeah. they're just total fails. Like they don't, these things are not practical. These things are not. Um, you know, they, they end up cost costing way more and they're not as good as something you could buy. Um, do you, does that kind of frustrate you when you see, like it frustrates me when I see stuff like that where, where it's like, they only care about the video or the photo of the product. Right. They don't really look at the practicality of it totally. at all. Right, right, right. Yes. It does drive me crazy. And I do get lost in that particular channel in five minute crafts and I get frustrated and angry and I'm like oh this is so ridiculous I'm wasting so much time but they do have some uh projects that I really like especially stuff for kids but um yeah I do agree a lot of it when you see it it's very frustrating um you know doing ridiculous things where you're using a glue gun or using whatever and you're like is that really I'm like no <laughs> but it's I guess yeah. the thing about that is that, you know, it's encouraging people, like reminding people you can make stuff and like, why don't you, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you can even make hot, but yeah. One, so one of the projects was, was we were laughing about was hot glue, like slippers or something. Yes. And it, they just look totally ridiculous. So, um, and I feel like some of those video, and then Jenna was like, you know, this definitely was not a five minute craft. Um, Cause <laughs> it took her like two hours, but I but just found it hilarious. Slipper. Yeah, I find it hilarious that some of these things you see on Pinterest, you're like, that is, that is not for real. Totally. You know what? I'm convinced that Pinterest is all Photoshop images and then fake write-ups, you know? And then actually I do see a lot of times people are commenting like, I tried your recipe. It doesn't work. <laughs> so. Or, 
or they go to these sites, like you'll click on the image thinking it'll take you right to the direct blog site. And it's some aggregate website where they've collected like 25 things you have to click through before you get to the thing you're actually looking for. And that's also one of my big pet peeves about Pinterest. Like, yes. I'm just like, you click on it and it's not what, like it's, it's some of the links are very misleading. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I feel like I, Pinterest for me is a very love hate relationship. Totally. And, and the five minute crafts too. Oh. I, I hate a lot of it, but I hate <laughs> some of it. So. Yeah, like so, uh, every once in a while you were saying there's like a good one, but then yeah. a lot of the stuff yeah. you're like, there's things you probably shouldn't use hot glue on or any video that tells you to like use hot glue in lieu of sewing. Yeah. I'm very leery of, or if they're using like glue, I'm like, yeah, that's not really gonna, yeah. not really gonna work very well. well I want to ask you, what are your favorite types of projects and what kinds of fabrics do you most enjoy working with? Um, so I love my favorite projects. Well, to sew, I love garment sewing. I just, there's something about being able to make something that I can wear that nobody else wears. It's so satisfying. Um, you know, I used to shop in a lot of stores where you'd go to, you know, you go out with your friends and they're like, Oh, I tried that shirt on last week. And you're like, great. <laughs> or show up to wedding. Actually, this did happen to me. I showed up to a wedding, a friend, friend of my husband's wedding wearing a dress and there was another girl wearing the dress. The same dress? <laughs> yes. I was like, this is why I need to sew all my clothes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I love sewing clothes because you'll get something that fits you. It's exactly what you want and nobody else has it. Um, because I have a new mom, well, new ish, she's almost four. Hey, do you, that, that's still new mom in my book. I don't know. Yeah. yeah I'm going to ride it for as long as I can. Yeah. We'll pretend I'm still young. So uh, because I'm a new mom, I do a lot of projects with my daughter. And especially because we're doing, you know, teaching elementary school kids, like lots of craft stuff, lots of things with googly eyes and like funny faces. But I love that stuff. Like it's just, it's fun to make. It's easy to do. I think that's my new fun thing is like just simple craft stuff. Um, as far as fabrics, I love a stretch cotton twill. I love working with that, especially for like fitted dresses. The stretch makes it great. I find the, the heaviness and the weight of the cotton twill just gives it so much substance. Um, and for crafts, felt. There, you can't go wrong with felt. Like you cut it, it doesn't fray. It maintains its shapes, bright, fun colors. Yeah. Now you do a lot of TV appearances where you go on and you show people how to make these crafts that you think of yourself. And some of the stuff I've seen, um, I'll link to Denise's YouTube channel and everything else below. But some of your, like your creativity level is just off the charts. Like some of the stuff you come up with, I'm like, how did she come up with that? Cause it's so genius. Um, like I think for Christmas you did, you had made like pretzels, like pretzels or cookies that look like reindeer or something. Like, how do you think of these things? And like how, like, I just kind of like, I, I feel like my mind just can't go there. Yeah. You know, I try to keep a, an eye on everything. Like I'm always looking for inspiration and I feel like inspiration comes from anywhere. So if you just start to pay attention to the littlest things, like you'll see a color or a shape or a funny face, or, you know, if you see a character, for example, you're like, Hey, that would work as a pillow, or I could turn that into a cookie. The other great thing that I find just for inspiration is just to go right to the store, whether it's a fabric store or craft store, because once you see the materials, I feel like that's what gives you kind of the final seal of what that project would be. So I'll have an idea in mind that, okay, I want to create some type of you know, office organizer using different pieces that'll give a final like gold spray paint over or purple spray paint over or something. But it's not until you're in the store and you're like, yeah, that'll work. Oh wait, no, I'm going to use this lazy Susan and make it like spin around or whatever it is. Um, so I like to look at, um, you know, unexpected inspirations, but for sure the supply store, like wherever you're going, if it's the grocery store, if it's the fabric store, um, just seeing exactly what they have and then just trying to think of a different way to use that. So offhand, what's like the most, what do you think is the most like creative craft project you've ever come up with? I don't oh know if you could, gosh. like, or maybe like something that was kind of out there or like different. I will tell you actually the one time where I couldn't stop bragging about how amazing I was <laughs> to myself and to my husband because he was stuck in the same room with me. 
Um, I was going to Vancouver. I had a, a segment planned in Vancouver and it was summer crafts. And um, there was an, an online classified listing website in Canada. It's called Kijiji. It's our version of Craigslist, but it's owned by eBay. So everybody up here uses Kijiji. And um, Kijiji wasn't sure, they sponsored me for the segment, but they didn't know until the very last minute. I had all of my bags packed. I had to leave for the airport. And my publicist texted me about an hour, like maybe like three, two or three hours before I was leaving to the airport, Kijiji is in. So I was like, oh my gosh, I need to quickly pull together a project. So I was like, what's summer? What can I take with me? Anyway, I found a kid's rocking chair for $5. I sent my husband in the car to go drive and pick it up. He picked it up, brought it back. And then I was like, what am I going to do with this? I got some um, dinosaurs and animal, like plastic dinosaurs and animals from the dollar store. And I got some block letters from the dollar store. So I spray painted the letters and the dinosaurs gold. I spray painted and I was, at first I was like, am I going to fly to Vancouver and spray this in the hotel at night and hope that it dries by the morning? I was like, no, I'm going to spray it now. And then it'll just have to dry in the box on the airplane. Um, and then I spray painted the chair. It was like this ancient brown rocking chair, like hideous. Um, I did it like kind of this dusty blue. And then I made the letters spell out roar. I hot glued the good old hot glue gun. I hot glued the letters on the back of the chair. Um, I put the animals on and it was so adorable and so amazing. It fit perfectly in a box. And I was at the airport within three hours and I was like, I am a queen craft rock star. <laughs> Wow. Wait, so where did you glue on those plastic dinosaurs? Was it like on the top or? Yeah. So the arch of the chair okay. had the roar written across oh. here. At the two ends, I had two of the dinosaurs. And then on the arms, I had like a lion and a whatever bear. And then underneath on the rock, the bow rocking part, I had two more. So it was super cute. Like the colors were awesome. I was like, I can't believe I pulled this off. And uh, I was very proud of myself. What happened to the rocking chair? Do you still have it? I do. It's in the basement, but because it, it actually went to Vancouver and then I presented again in Calgary and then it flew back to here. So it's just, all the pieces are detached. So I still have to hot glue it back together. All right. Maybe that could be, you could do an update on it and, and maybe like re refresh the chair. I don't know. That sounds awesome. And that's interesting. So you have to travel with all these craft supplies and projects. Yeah. Like, how do you do that? Like, I hate, I don't like traveling very, like, I don't like having to schlep my stuff around. Like, totally. like what, do you have any secrets for that? Like, that's crazy. Oh my gosh. I don't, you know, I, and I, I am normally a very light packer, but with all the crafts, I'll go to Vancouver, like overnight or Montreal. Like I'll do just a, like I'll fly in that night, fly out the next morning and I'll have four suitcases plus a sewing machine box. It's, it's crazy. Like if you see me at the airport with like 12 boxes, I'm going overnight somewhere. <laughs> and, so, and sewing machines aren't, you know, some of them can be yeah. a little bit heavy because I've seen your, now how did you originally get started doing these TV appearances? So when I had the sewing school, um, I initially wanted to do TV to promote the business, to try and get more customers in. Um, so I was reaching out to TV stations back then. And then I had some TV stations reach out to me too, because um, I was the only sewing school in uh, Toronto at the time, or the only mm -hmm. hobby sewing school, not you know, the, we have universities and colleges that have that as well. Um, but, but I would have people reaching out to me too, saying, you know, we're doing something on fabric. Can you come and show this? So um, it just kind of worked synergistically. It, um, you know, it was partly me reaching out and partly me just having my information out there and then people reaching out back to me. That's awesome. And you also have some DVDs. So you, as a gift, you sent me some of your DVDs that you that are teach so and you have an online class and i'll link to that stuff as well um i watched the dvds they were so helpful like I, when i watched them i'd already been sewing for a couple of years yeah. but i really feel like you explain things in a way that's very approachable and easy yeah. to understand because sometimes those sometimes when you watch videos or you read books about sewing it's really hard to wrap your mind around the concept yeah. 
because it's a different language, right? It's a different language. You're doing something completely different. So I think that's really key to teaching people is just use bare basics, you know, as much as you can break it down step by step. Remember that somebody doesn't know that you have to lift the presser foot to pull out your fabric. You know, you really have to spell it out step by step. So Denise's classes are, I highly recommend them if you're trying to get into garment sewing and you, you just need some extra help. You know, there are some crafts, there are lots of classes out there, but I really feel like as an instructor, I think you're one of the better ones I've seen that explains the concepts and shows you how to do things. Uh, Cause I think in your DVDs, you showed people how to do this, like three different types of skirts. Yeah. Um, I think you did do the drawstring back. And I think there was another project as well. Um, but it was just those, very, are, um, those are my go-tos. Yeah. But again, they were very easy to do. And I really think you're one of like, obviously you have a gift for teaching people that just comes naturally. Thank you. And do you have formal training in sewing? Or are you just all self-taught pretty no, much? Well, I mostly self-taught. I did take sewing in high school. Um, yeah, that was, that was it for my official formal training. It was m mostly self-taught, of course, sewing by Nancy. I watched, or sewing with Nancy. I watched all the time growing up. Um, and you know, my mom, uh, teaching me things from, from time to time, my grandma, um, yeah, in high school, and that was it. If I had known that there was such a thing as fashion school when I was in high school, I absolutely would have gone to fashion school. I didn't know, you know, and that's that goes back to flaws in our education system, I think. You know, it went, and with our generation, people are told, are you going to study science or are you going to study um, arts or are you going to be a lawyer or are you going to be, a, you know, that teacher? Like, they're kind of, you're like told, like, these are the five things you can choose from. It's interesting to see like a lot of, uh, even professionally, there's a resurgence in things like crafting and yeah. making things. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I definitely think there's a, you know, a lot of these professions may be lucrative, but they may not fulfill that creative outlet or need you have. So I yeah. think that's why a lot of people, like that's why I really enjoyed sewing so much. And that's why you enjoy sewing. Yeah. It's just because you get so much more out of it and so much satisfaction. Oh, um, right. Yeah, there's an emotional fulfillment. Of course, you know, you're getting to do things and making clothes and whatever, having fun, but there, there is an emotional component, so. Very cool. And uh, you have a daughter, right? And does she, and you, I've seen you post her a few videos of her trying to use your sewing machine. Is she, do you, do you think she has a future with sewing? Yeah, well, I mean, she loves crafts. She loves sewing. I started, I taught her how to sew when she was 18 months old because I have a sewing machine with a push button. I'm like, I'm always sewing. She can easily press the foot pedal. Do the so, and she really likes it. You know, it's time that we spend together and she can see things come together, making little projects for her dolls or her, for her friends. And we're actually um, working on some stuff for her classmates next. So that's Ooh. Great. And uh, does your husband sew at all? Does he? He does. Yes. He does. All right. He does too. He really enjoys it. Um, so actually we had plans of doing like a family sewing day at Christmas time. We were going to all sew our own pair of Christmas pajamas because normally I sew pajama pants for him at Christmas. Um, but we just, we were too lazy at Christmas. We were doing a lot of eating, <laughs> resting and relaxing. So we still have all of the pajama, like all the Christmas fabric. And my daughter still reminds me once every few weeks, mommy, we have to cut that. <laughs> well, maybe you can, maybe you could just recycle the Christmas pants from the year before and then give yourself a break this year. <laughs> exactly. Well, I could, I, or I can say that I'm like super early and on top of it. Yeah, for, you are. Yeah. I still have Christmas fabric from two years ago that I, yeah. Um, that's the thing with those seasonal fabrics is that like, there's a certain window of time you have to like make the project and then you're like, well, yes. it's going to have to be for next year. Uh, right. Do you, um, where do you like to shop for fabric? Oh, well, uh, so I say that reluctantly. Um, we have our version of Joann's in Canada is called Fabricland. And that's where I shop the most because it's the most convenient. It's close to me. I'm in the suburbs, you know, um, but it, my fellow Canadians will know that there's, there's a love hate thing happening with Fabricland. <laughs> They, and Jennifer, if you ever came up here and visited a Fabricland with me, you would die. But um, they are like they're super archaic I shouldn't bash them you know what that that is where I go so I shouldn't bash them but they just they write everything by hand when they when you buy something so they may not have the most up-to-date technology for the uh for the stores okay I gotcha I mean it is called fabric land you know at least you know what they've got there right 
I do shop there. I love their sales. I love how convenient it is to me. The one near me is like everybody who works there is really nice. Um, in Vancouver on the West Coast, I love Fabricana. It's like, oh, like this amazing, like 30,000 square foot space filled with gorgeous fabrics. Of course, in New York, in the garment district, there are like pretty much every single store you walk into is incredible for fabric shopping. Uh, and then in Toronto on Queen Street West, which is our fashion district, um, I love Leo's textiles and also um, King Textiles is very good. Do you shop online for fabric at all, or do you, do you mostly do you mostly do like in like store like store shopping? I knew you were going to ask me and I wish I shopped online. I can't do it yet. I should ask you for tips. Do you shop well, online? Oh, mo mostly. Um, Denise, I'm lazy and I don't like leaving my house. So I... But don't I, you love touching fabric? You know, I do. I do. But at the same time, I'm the... So here's my thing. Um, when I would shop for clothes, here was my system. Yeah. So I would go to the store like once and try things on just so I knew what size I was in that store. Yeah. And then after that, I would buy everything from the store's website. But oh. j just after figuring out, like, I'm like, hey, in this store, I'm like a six short yeah. pants. Um, so I would go to, like, Ann Taylor Loft or something. Yeah. Um, you know, but, and that's the thing. Like, I don't like, I used to love going to the mall as a kid and as a teenager. And then as I got older, I'm just like, yeah, I'm pretty much over that. <laughs> um, so I'm super, I'm just lazy like that. So I would just do that where I would go figure out what my size was. And then from then on, I would just buy everything online. Nice. Um, so that's sort of my system. Um, I think with fabrics, um, once I know the substrate of it, I feel pretty comfortable with shopping online. And when I was, when I usually shop online, I was more looking for specific prints, right. you know, like I'm looking for cotton and steel, you know, this print. Um, right. Or once you kind of know what, what it's like, I've taken a chance on some fabrics. Like there's a couple of discount websites like Fabric Wholesale Direct and Fashion Fabrics Club. And then I do fabric.com a lot. Okay. So some of these fabrics you are sort of taking a chance on, right, but right. sometimes the price you're like, well, it's a good price. So right. even if I don't really like the fabric, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. I've had they'll very never let, few. They'll never let you do returns, right? They, I have actually returned fabric from uh, Joann's. So I got some fabric from Joann's right. and they had footprints, like footprints on them. Like, <laughs> so, like somebody had stepped on the fabric. Um, so I, I actually was able to do a return. I think they send you like a UPS bag or something right. and you just have to send the fabric back. Um, there was, I've had some really good, cust like some of the smaller websites, like the homegrown ones, their customer service is excellent. Um, I had one, I forgot what company it was. It might've been like Hawthorne's Threads or something. So I ordered some fabric and they sent me the wrong fabric. Okay. So I reached out and I was like, hey, this actually wasn't what I ordered. Um, I think they realized the cost of shipping back the other fabric would like really negate. So they're like, just keep the mistake fabric and we'll send you the new fabric. Wow. Um, so some of them, like for, especially with the smaller companies, they really want to take care of the customers. Yeah. And also like it would cost more to send the fabric back and for them to deal with it. Than right. just, like eat the cost. Yeah. Um, and I've noticed a few fabric companies also, they'll send you extra fabric or if it's like the end of the bolt, like you might order two yards and you end up getting three. Right. Um, right so I've had good experience. I've had mostly good experiences with ordering fabric online. I know some yeah. people don't like it and I think it's, it's something, you know, some people like certain things and other people like yeah. doing it another way, but I've had overall pretty good experiences buying fabric online. That's so good. I'm envious because obviously you're saving time and like, yeah, that's really, really awesome. But really the key factor is my laziness. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. So I'm just one of those people. I, if I can, like, I'll even order like random household things online, like cat litter or like paper towels. Right. 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 And do like the subscription thing. Like, Hey, because <laughs> I would always like run it like instead of running out like I think I was in the I'm in targets like subscribe and save um, uh -huh. Although now I don't do that because we just moved into an apartment right, right, um, right. So now like I would have to go to the office and pick up like a 20 pound Box of cat litter. So right. I have actually started buying that but when we were in a house yeah. I would do a lot of subscription purchases yeah. for household items yeah. Just because it was it was easier. Um so can I ask about that? Do they send it automatically, right? Or can you ever like pause? I'm you can pause it. Yeah. Oh, like on Target and Amazon, yes, you, you can skip a, like if you're not sure how often you need an item, you can yeah. skip a delivery. Okay. 
Um, you know, cause with the cat litter for a while, I was like, wow, like I had, like, I started, comp- <laughs> like, it really started stockpiling up at the house. I would have like, you know, five things of cat litter. So I started skipping the deliveries or you can switch them. Like you can do every month, every two months, every okay. three months. So you can really customize your experience with it. I'm, I'm a, I'm a very loyal Amazon shopper. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've, I've learned to navigate the ins and outs of Amazon and Walmart. When, when they were first trying to compete with Amazon, they would offer free two day shipping on any order over $35. Wow. So I started ordering like really random, like I would order like face astringent from there, yeah. like anything where I just was too lazy to go to the store. Yeah. Um, but I noticed Walmart has kind of changed things. The prices for online items are different than the physical stores. Wait, less? It's more. More? Yeah. So they're offering you the free shipping, but like I was looking at some, but it didn't like at first, and I've noticed several companies doing that. So at first they have it. So that's a better deal to order it online, but now they're almost like trying to encourage you to shop at the store now. So some items from Walmart, I was noticing this other, the other day, cause I was going to order some stuff from Walmart, but the prices were Less if you picked it up at the store and more if you were ordering online, I guess to kind of cover the shipping costs or something. So I felt like that was a little chintzy, but I was like, all right, I get, I get it. Walmart, you know, I'm, I I get, I get where you're coming from, you know, cause when that, when I would buy stuff from Amazon, it was free shipping. Plus they have to ship it and they have to pay for the packing supplies. So like things would come in a big box or whatever. Um, but the target subscribe and save, I actually got some pretty good deals on that. Um, and there was free shipping. Yeah. So if it's free shipping and the item is the same price or less than at the store, I'll, I'll buy it online. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, yeah. So I like, I like online shopping a lot. That's good. I love that you do fabric. That's really good. So yeah. And the fabric and fabric.com is owned by Amazon. So you can, and I've noticed they've moved more of their inventory to Amazon because yeah. for a while fabric.com didn't do that, but now I've noticed they've started doing it, but I've also noticed that the price they charge on Amazon is more than fabric.com, but you get the free ship. Like they have like lower thresholds for sometimes there's free shipping on fabric.com, but fabric like with no order minimum, but on fabric.com, I think you have to order $45 to get free shipping. So I see where these online businesses are trying to make it worth their while. And also, you know, again, if there's no order minimum, you kind of have to raise the price, Right. you know, but if there is an order minimum that, you know, people have to buy more. So they're like, okay. But I've been noticing these little things and I'm like, that's interesting to see where this is all going. You know, I'm sure at at some point Amazon will just start anticipating, like even now, um, I saw a video where Gary Vaynerchuk ordered something online and he's just like, am Alexa, order me some toothpaste or something. And literally it just, you know, because it's linked to your Amazon account, literally he's like, I just ordered toothpaste in 11 seconds or something. So th- I mean, it's kind of creepy in a way. Um, we don't have one of those devices because I, we don't really like where that's going. Right. But it's creepy. Like, it's weird to realize all I have to do is say, you know, Google Home or Amazon Alexa, order me socks or something, and they'll just show up. Um, do you remember Back to the Future? Are you too young for Back to the Future? Oh, no. I've, oh, I've seen, I've seen all the movies. Remember when he went to the future and then they walked in the home and they were like lights on and the lights are on. I remember as a kid watching that being like, Oh my goodness. They said lights on and the t- lights turn on. But like, and now, yeah. Although the, the, the thing I wonder is who is li- like, you know, as we've kind of seen, they've had some issues with listening to your conversations. Um, I oh, also had a pop up talk now. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, gonna be all cat litter now right <laughs> yeah and I've also had a friend I had a friend who uh, some friends got one of those uh, they got an Alexa or like an Amazon Echo or whatever and they were talking about baby stuff they don't even have any kids and then on Facebook like three seconds later they start seeing baby ads so um clearly it's just a way to help companies market better to people it is a little it is a little strange though you know to see it's very, it's very, we're living in a weird world, aren't we? Yeah, you know? yes. It's weird and amazing and scary and wonderful and everything. I don't know. Well, I do. So let's talk about um, where people can find you online. You have a website, you have a YouTube channel, and I think your YouTube channel is one of the most underrated sewing YouTube channels on the you internet. So crazy. You've said that before and you've complimented me before and I am so 
humbled and embarrassed because I'm really bad. I used to try to be good at putting content on there and I've been so bad lately. I have to tell you actually when um, some of the sewing tutorials that I would do that I would film by myself, it was when my daughter was first born and she, I don't know if anybody's a new mom, they'll know that your baby like knows when you are awake and like your baby will not sleep and will not let you shower, will not let you film videos, like your baby will let you do anything. So the, there's a whole chunk of videos that I used to, uh, that I used to film between like 2.30 and 4 in the morning, but like one hour and a half when she was dead asleep and my husband would be like, are you filming again? I feel like in my closet, like the lights are on, you'll see like in the back, it's like pitch black outside. That could have been an interesting title for the series, like sewing at 4 a.m. or something. That well, was, that's 4 a.m. while my baby's asleep for 10 minutes. Oh, and I think that's, you know, again, I don't have any kids, but it does look like it's very challenging to balance the sewing with, you Sorry. know, taking care of a baby or taking care of a kid. Like they have needs. And I, you know, one of my friends was like, I'd like to start quilting, but I think my kid's going to get into the iron or something, you know? I mean, so it, gonna, well, like cats, I, I, I don't have a cat, but I've heard that cats love fabric and thread. Oh, and yeah and they're on top of it right yeah pretty much if you leave anything out the cat like so my mom sent me years ago you, you are you familiar with Vera or bradley like the bag company yeah. so she sent me a like a case for my ipad it was like a little quilted yeah. case i put it on the coffee table and the cat i came back and the cat was using it as a cat bed <laughs> Like, so anything that's like, they like texture, you that's know, they like any, yeah. cause she's, and she, she was squeezing herself so that her body fit perfectly into the like perimeter of the case. I mean, it was, it was padded, you know, it looked to her, it looked like a cat, but they like it. They like anything that is not for them. Right. Or that has like a, like a, I don't know. They just like different feels, I guess. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes she likes laying on hard floors. Sometimes oh. she likes laying on a blanket. Um, but yeah, if you leave fabric out, they will get on it and start laying on it, quilts, whatever you, whatever you've got. I'm sure kids do that to some degree too. Um, but cats are pretty weird. Yeah. I, I, no, kids don't lay on the fabric. Kids just know, kids can sense <laughs> when you're there or when you're awake or when you're showering. <laughs> now, so you and I kind of keep it real. I've noticed there are a lot of, sometimes I look at these sewing blogs or like home blogs or like DIY blogs. Um, and sometimes I kind of feel like, I'm like, how are these people keeping it all together? Like, like every day they've got a new photo of them, like in a style, a perfectly stylized home, you know, with like, you know, kids all in matching outfits. And I'm like, how are you, how are you still sane? Like, I know the batch photos, batch and I'm photos. Just like, and they're tossing all other 200 photos out. I know that for me, if I'm taking a picture of my daughter, there'll be at least like 20, 30 shots of her, like. <laughs> of her doing whatever. And then there's like one, yeah, like there'll be like 5,000 pictures and you've got like one good one or something. I don't know, sometimes. The curse of social media, we all put out like the, be the best stuff, but. but I feel like, I feel like I want to go in the other direction and do the opposite. Just because I feel like I, as a viewer, I appreciate, I appreciate people yeah. keeping it real. That's I why I think I like Jenna Marbles because she's like, yeah, screw it. I'm just right. like in a, so this lady has 17 million subscribers. She doesn't sure. have like high production value, which I really appreciate. Like that's the thing. Like, I love that. Yeah. She does not care. Um, right. So she tapes everything like at her kitchen table. Her house is very messy. And I, again, to some degree, I'm like, you, yeah, maybe you could clean up every once in a while but at the same time I'm like you know what I feel better about life knowing right. that someone who probably makes a lot of money a year from YouTube <laughs> lives in a messy house oh, and doesn't yeah. care yeah. you know you know oh, she's a friend if I go over to somebody's house and they're like excuse the mess I'm like if your house wasn't messy I wouldn't feel comfortable yeah <laughs> like, and, like, and when you go over to their house and it's like it, their definition of messy is like much different than your definition but you're like how you're like it's set. Uh, you know, and sometimes do you ever wonder if they're just saying that, like they really clean the house for six hours? Oh, I can't excuse the mess. Like, it's like when they bake and they dust the the, the flour on their face. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've just been working all day. You know, I don't know. I didn't have time to clean. I don't know. I feel like there's to some degree. I feel like we could use a little more, not authenticity, but a little more relatability in this space. Yeah. I don't know. I'd like to see more people just kind of, you know not worrying as much about perfection and more just worrying about having fun. 
Yeah. And a lower level of stress, you know? Yeah. Like, I just, I don't know. That's why I kind of like, again, I could have cleaned this. I was like, yeah, you know, people, you know, people are going to then your your honest craft or your honest sewing room I forget what your hashtag was yeah, I think I was calling it honest craft room for a while you know you know like there's random stuff all over the place or whatever you know that's what life is and I'm not like so we we've bought and sold a few houses and we have um we've been married my husband and I have been married for nine years we have no like really nice furniture and we don't decorate our house like you know we'll do it for this like for the last house we did it for the staging but on an everyday basis, it kind of, our, our lifestyle is very like college dorm room-ish. <laughs> I, I'm serious. Like right now, the sheets on my bed don't even like match, you know? <laughs> so it's one of those things where it's like, it doesn't matter. Like that sort of thing doesn't matter to me. I don't well, like not- hang, I don't hang framed pictures on the wall. Like I like sewing, obviously I like making stuff, yeah. but in my everyday life, I, I don't, I, you know, and I, I appreciate interior design and I like it. Yeah. But on a personal level, I just don't do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that makes me a slob. I have no idea. Um, but we pretty much just make our house look nice for sell for selling it. And other than that, it does not. It but does not look that good. On that enjoyment, right? Or do you not even care? Like you're not. You're like I don't even need a picture on that wall. Um, no, I don't know. We just don't really have any photos, you know, so we don't really do that. And I think when I own the house, I'm like, I don't want to put any nail holes in it (laughs) because I'm just going to sell the house. Um, so I don't really have a personal attachment to houses. Yeah. I don't know. I know you're like, wow, this girl's crazy, (laughs) but, uh, you know, it's just not something that, that, that we, that we put a lot of time or effort or like, we also don't buy, like, I don't buy a lot of home decor stuff. Right. Um, I don't know. It's just one of those things where, like, I think because of the cat, like, she gets cat hair all over everything. So I'm like, eh, whatever. I don't know. But so I have. Sewn oh, home decor? Have I what? Sewn home decor? Oh, yes. I have sewn it. Um, But then when I make it, I don't have anything. To, I don't have any purpose. So usually I just do it as gifts, you know? Right, right, right. Like, I make nice stuff for other people, but, like, I don't know. It's just. Like, I don't have, like, a homemade quilt on my bed or anything right. um, like that. But maybe some, maybe someday. But I think in our minds, this, like, we're probably 10 years away from our forever house. Right. So in right. my mind, I just, I'm like, you know, I don't want anything nice yet. And yeah. also, I'm too cheap to, like, spend the money on nice furniture. I, I don't it. know. It could yeah. be something like that. I'm not really sure why I'm like that. Um, but at least I have found a partner that is also like that. So it's yeah. one of those things. You know, I don't know. So everybody has their own things that they that they want to spend their time and money on, right? So exactly, exactly. What do you like to spend your time and money on? Like, what are you like? Do you have any? Um, I don't know. I've been in saving mode for so for so long. Maybe like, can, I mean, some people like candles. Some people like you know collecting. I don't know teapots. Like, could be. No, I would say like vacationing and experiences I think I think that's kind you of you do like to travel a lot yeah yeah I do I like to travel a lot and um and do things I think that's kind of my biggest thing and actually I am trying to make a shift because I would always buy a lot of objects but then I find like around my house I just don't want that anymore like it's collecting dust or it's something that I'm never going to use or you know even like a photo album like oh I'm going to put picture like and you her, never end up doing it and it just ends up sitting around you're like yeah around I spent money on that album like it's giving me <laughs> because it's another project that I haven't yet started so I think I'm done with things and objects and like I just want to go on vacation or go on date night or you know what I mean like yeah or create like experiences for your family or something that no I I that makes a lot of sense unfinished projects that's my <laughs> because you spend money on it right and you buy all these things you're like I'm gonna use it for this and then you never end up doing anything with it and then like we just got rid of like half of our stuff and a lot of stuff we bought like was like I had a purpose for this initially but it's still in the box and now I'm basically getting rid of it Um, and I have to say I love your 2018 challenge of like not buying any fabric and I totally love that way of living I think that's so important because again as sewers, we love fabric. We love the prints. We love the colors. We love the the touch of everything. So we're like, oh yeah, this will be good. This will be good. This will be good. And next thing you know, we've got a wall or a room or a drawer or like an entire area 
half a house, depending on how much of a hoarder you are, filled with fabric that you haven't used or maybe one day will never use, right? So instead, like, I'm just trying to purge a lot of stuff. And then what I would like to do is only buy whatever I'm going to use right then. Like, I'm going to yeah, go yeah. out on a Saturday. I'm going to make myself a dress. What fabric is here at Fabricland? Because I do like shopping at Fabricland. <laughs> buy it and then take it home and sew the dress, right? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. I, and that's why I, I was like, I have so much fabric and I have like probably like a couple years supply. So I'm like, <laughs> it, but it's so tempting because these companies know how to get you. They're always coming out with new fabric. Yeah. That looks exciting. Like I was even looking at cloud nine's website and they've got like some glimmer fabric. And I was like, man, I wish I hadn't banned myself. <laughs> it's only February. Well, what about gifts? It's hard. <laughs> It's uh, I've decided if I get fabric for free or as a gift, I need to get rid of the equivalent amount of fabric. Oh, so I think I'm gonna destash. I'm so I've decided what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna destash it really cheap on my destash Instagram account. So if I have to get rid of stuff, Instagram account. I do. I think it's like sewing report shop or shop sewing report. I do want to ask you what? How do you feel like social media could help um, the sewing industry? Um, I think one of the biggest hurdles for people. Um, that I've talked to who don't sew is buying a sewing machine. Um, you know, like I feel like a lot of people don't want to go to a dealership or, you know, they, they want to be able to do everything online. But then when you talk to people and they're like, hey, well, you really need to go to a local dealership. I feel like a lot of young people just won't do that. Um, how do you like what do you think would be like a game changer for sewing machines like an Uber, like kind of like an Uber for sewing machines? Um. So what do you mean, like like a new type of sewing machine? or Like, a new, like, like a new way of buying and servicing sewing machines. Like, because I was thinking, like, if somebody oh, could come up with something like that, right? like a way to make it a lot easier for people to get a sewing machine. You know what I think it is? I think the biggest hurdle for a beginner or for somebody buying a machine is that they feel like if I buy a machine, I won't know what to do with it. So I think yeah. to, for to get product out to people, you have to provide information and education along with the machine and maybe fewer options, you know, right yeah. now, so many different machines out there, you know, every company has all these different makes and models and the person's like, but I just need to hem my daughter's pants or I just need to make Halloween costumes once a year. So it's hard because I know in like the land of consumerism, like there's always like, what's the new model? What are you competing with this year? Like what 12 new things have you come up with this month? But I really think if we're, if we're trying to think of like a new way of reaching customers in a modern way and getting them sewing, it would be basic machines or like three levels, like yeah. one, two, ABC. And then here's your information. Like, here's all your fabric, here's all your videos, here's all your whatever, like a big giant bundle kit, right? Because then I think people, you know, we're living in a digital age, we're at home, we're not going to the grocery store to buy toilet paper or whatever. Um, you know, why would you want to go to a dealer where you know you're talking to a salesperson and then, you know, is he going to upsell me? Do I really need 75,000 different stitches? Do I really need an embroidery attachment? Like I'm not interested in doing embroidery or whatever it is. And then you're like, well, how do I buy fabric? Then I have to go to this store at the other end of town, or maybe you live in a small town where they don't even have a fabric store. How am I going to buy fabric online? So I think that would be really big if people, if somebody would come along. Yeah. And kind of bundle. That's a really good point too. And a lot of business where we bundle. I know. And you know what? That's the other thing. I think you're right. Simplicity would almost be better. And um, I think a lot of people who are, and also when you're a beginner, you don't know what your needs are. You don't know what kind of, like you don't know what you're going to end up sewing. So like you might buy a machine and you realize a couple of years later, this is not really fitting my needs. So it's like a, the chicken and the egg. Like it's hard to know what your needs are. So to buy a sewing machine, but if you don't actually sew, you're not going to, like, you need a sewing machine totally. to know. And I think that's, I've heard people say that's why knitting and crocheting are more popular is because oh. there's less of a barrier to entry. Like you only need like knitting needles or a crochet hook. Right. Um, and it's a little bit more portable. Yeah. I've heard the complaint from people who live in cities that they just don't have space for it. Right, right, right. Um, do you feel like places like sewing lounges could help do, like, fill that gap, like, in urban areas? 
You know, so when you I had, when we had our sewing school, I would always tout the value of learning from an instructor and learning in a class environment. And if that were, if that were the case and everybody could do that, I would absolutely push that because you, your instructor knows so much and to be able to be hands-on with you and actually show you, no, wait, you have to move this over here. Oh no, wait, this is upside down. When you're at home learning from a video or in learning from a book, you don't know that you're doing this backwards. Um, uh, you know, and then when you're in a classroom with lots of other people, somebody's asking a question that you never would have asked and you're going to learn from that. Or the teacher will like go off on a tangent and you'll learn from that. So I for sure think in a perfect world, a classroom setting is the best environment. Learning from somebody who's been doing it for ages is great, but it's just not who we are these days. You know, yeah. like somebody's got four kids, somebody does shift work, somebody lives in a small town, like somebody has four jobs. Like we don't have time to go to a class once a week. And then like we were just saying, go to this store to buy fabric, yeah. go to that store to have your machine service. You know, it's just, uh, you know, what? I almost kind of wonder if live sewing classes might be good, you know, like some, some place where you can interact with the instruction in real time. And maybe be able to ask questions because like we were, we've talked about this before. You're right. With the online classes, there's no back and forth. Right. And it's hard. It's real. Sometimes it's hard. Like some of the classes I I have from Craftsy, some of them are better than others. I feel like, but you know, like if like, or from a tutorial, like I might have a really specific question and I think having more of a real time interaction might be helpful to people too. Um, having some something live or something like if you're maybe like maybe there was some way to like Skype with your teacher Mm -hmm. um, so they can see what you're doing too so they can watch you so and see if you're like because for the first few months of my quilting life I was not using a quarter inch seam at all um, and I didn't realize my blocks were off mathematically um until I went to a class and like, I was like, wait, this is different. So I sewed and the reason I found out was that I, I had sewn some blocks in the class. And then when I got home and was sewing them on my sewing machine, I realized that it was not, they were not, they were not the same. Yeah. Um, so I think you're right. There is value in having a real life instructor versus yeah. just a video or something. Um, again, I think some videos are bad, are really great. And some YouTube videos are awesome. Mm. But I do think like long-term for your sewing education, it is good to have Mm -hmm. some sort of physical class or some sort of interaction with the real people too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I do like the idea. We need to, but we need to find some way to bundle up all this stuff and, and do that. Cause I I think you're right. Like if it came with everything you needed and you didn't have to buy extra stuff, that would make it simpler for people. And I think another thing I've noticed when I've talked to people who don't sew, they have no perception of real prices so (laughs) like they would think they like I've talked to people honestly who think a hundred dollars sewing machine is really expensive yes let's talk about that this is one of my pet peeves that people want to spend a hundred dollars on a sewing machine and I can understand you know what I respect everybody's budget I respect everybody's scenario and whatever (laughs) you can buy a hundred dollar sewing machine it has to be used but I just think I always tell people that a sewing machine is like an appliance. You really should spend the most you can afford because it's going to last you forever. Like they'll all do the same job. They'll all sew two pieces of fabric together, but how long will the machine last? How many additional features will it have? How often will you need to service it? How much trouble will it give you? You know, can you sew chiffon and denim and fleece and this? Um, you know, and yeah, so I always, I, I try not to discourage people because I want everyone to be sewing and I do understand that there are limitations and like sometimes, Hey, I just want to spend a hundred dollars on a sewing machine. I totally get that. But if that's the case, I would say, try to buy used or ask your aunt or ask your, your coworkers mother, if he has one, if she has one in her basement. Um, because I think for a good quality sewing machine, you do have to invest in it. And actually the, the prices in the States and in Canada are much different. You have to spend a lot more in Canada, but, um, but yeah, it's just so important to have a good quality machine and that machine will grow with you, will last you decades and decades and decades. And then you'll have success with your project instead of being like, why is my machine jamming all the time? Why is this happening? 
and like the majority of the people I know who have bought sewing machines, but like don't really know what they're doing. They all have the same story. They bought it from Costco when they were there, or they just ordered it from like Overstock or Amazon. Uh, but they didn't really like, that's the thing when you, when you just start, you don't really know what you're buying. You know? you know what? And this goes back to providing information and education, not overwhelming people, you know, to, to give them, like, I definitely think people need that hand holding, And I think you and I need to create this business where we, create- I really, where we, we, we sell an all in one, like it comes with everything you need, some lessons or something. Yeah. You but know. if anybody is watching this video, we did it first. Yes, <laughs> okay. I know. We 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 are marking. We are we are uh, we are definitely uh, the first to this idea. I mean, you know, and my husband had another thought. Um, I think one of the things that I think would dispel young people from sewing is the whole idea that you have to keep bringing the sewing machine back for servicing. Right. Like again, I'm super lazy. I probably should have taken my machine in this year. I didn't. Um, so it's one of those things yeah. where. I do wish that, and my husband was like, I'm sure there's a way that you could create a sewing machine that doesn't really need maintenance. Yeah. Like we had a brother machine for several years yeah. and it wasn't, it was like a $400 machine and we never needed to take it in. Right. So I do think there's so, like, while I appreciate dealers and people who work on sewing machines, yeah. I do think in order to really encourage people to sew and start doing this more, yeah. there needs to be an easier way for you to get and own a sewing machine yeah. versus having to constantly go to this place to get it serviced. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I know, I, I know that I'm opening up a can of worms and there's a lot of controversy over this issue, but if you want to get younger people to sew, you have to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. And doing that stuff is not, is not easy. Um, right. People like, especially when you're competing with businesses who make it so easy for consumers that they don't have to leave the house. Mm-hmm. If you want sewing to be a big thing, the sewing industry makes needs to make it so that you don't need to leave your house. Right. And maybe what they do need is an amazing $100 machine. Maybe that's yes. like a really great machine that, that yeah. does not cost a lot of money. And that's the thing. Like I, maybe it could almost be like a loss leader, um, like something where like kind of like with phones, you know, some right. of the phones are really inexpensive, but they're, you know, they make up for it with, right. you know, with, with you paying for service. Maybe there could be something of like, I was even thinking maybe there could be something where it's like a monthly membership, but included in the membership is you get a free sewing machine, you know, or something like that. Like you get classes or you get fabric or something or pat and patterns yeah. and supplies. And yeah. if you pay, if you commit to a year, you know, they send you a sewing machine, yeah. a decent. And that's the thing, like the, some of the hundred dollar machines are not great. Some of them are decent. Um, that's what I'm saying. Let's challenge the sewing machine manufacturer. Make a good one. Yeah. If you really want to get people to sew and even though, yeah. Yeah. And they have to think of it more long-term. They need to create lifelong customers. You are exactly right. If you can provide people with an amazing, good quality, reliable, heavy duty sewing machine that costs a hundred dollars, that doesn't break down. That person is now whatever brand sewing machine you are, that person is now your loyal customer because people buy the exact same machine over and over again. They know that brand. And if you're starting with a younger generation and they're not spending as much, then you have that customer for like 50 years. Exactly. And they might and they might upgrade to your more expensive machine once they get more interested. Or buy all your other junk. Yeah. I, exactly. So so if you start off with the one hundred dollar machine, and I think that's something smart that ever that Bernina did when they started the Everson line. Right. right is right. they they made a lot like and I've used the Everson. I think it's a great machine, especially yeah. for the prices. Um so I've been using I they actually sent me one to try out. It's a it's a really good little machine. Yeah. It's designed by the people who make Bernina, right. but they realized they needed to come down in price to appeal to people because yeah. the Bernina machines are pretty expensive, some right. of them. Yeah. Um, and, and a 20 year old does not have the money for a $3,000 sewing machine. And the 20 year old is the person who you want as your customer. Yeah. yeah. Because they're buying, they're, they're spending more over their lifetime and their lifetime is longer. So. Exactly. So even though they're buying, they may buy that $100 machine at first. 10 years from now, they might buy your $1,000 machine. And then 10 years from then, they might buy your $5,000 machine. I think the key to the sewing machine companies is they need to start thinking about creating like those lifelong customers. Um, but they're not going to do it by, and they're not going to do it by selling $5,000 machines. Right. Like, because we know the customer that's buying $5,000 machines, it's not, 
it's not an 18 year old girl or, you know, a 20, even a 25 year old. Um, the people that I know and the people I know that have bought sewing machines, um, they're not like broke college students. They're people that are professionals. Mm -hmm. They make decent money, but they still in their mind think a hundred dollars is expensive for a sewing machine. They just have such a different perception of price. Right. But if we could provide them with a good quality machine, at least we'd have them in, right? Exactly. That's the thing. We just need to get them in the door, you know? And All right, we need to work on this, Denise. Do you want to start a sewing machine company with me? I think that's what we need to do. Forget I think we do. One of the big ones. Let's start our own. All right, we can be the Uber of the sewing machine industry. I'm telling, well, think about it. Look at what Uber did to cab companies you in know like a year. That's another conversation too. I am so like... I get really frustrated when any company, whether it's a car manufacturer or a cab company, you know, with any industry is being left behind. And then instead of catching up, Mm -hmm. they'll complain, look for, you know, government bailouts, whatever it is. That drives me crazy. That drives me crazy. Like times are changing. Everybody's got to keep up. Exactly. Um, I think I, I think we've got some idea. Wow, this has been a great conversation. We came up with a business idea. Um, we're. I know. I wish we lived closer. We could craft together. We would have slumber, sewing slumber parties all the time. I think, and maybe that could be a new thing too. We could. Um, and I talked to some ladies. Why we're sewing slumber parties. That could be. Our that could be a thing. So you sleep over at somebody. Adult slumber parties where you sew things and hang out. It sounds um, like it's getting X-rated. And, and I just talked to some ladies the other day. Um, the ladies, they, they wrote a book called this thing called Handmade Getaway. And they're trying to encourage people to do so, like to have like social sewing getaways, which was cool. Um, and I think that's one thing. Sewing can be such a social thing, something you do with friends. And I think that's another way we could maybe try to encourage more people to do it is by having, instead of you getting together with your friends and watching TV, why not get together and sew something and, you know, teach your friends how to sew? Yes. I've talked about with a lot of my friends about that and people always say, oh, let's do this. And I say, oh yeah, I'll do, let's do this. But I should actually, actually do it because that's, you're right. It's such a good idea. It's something fun. And then we'll have them sucked into it. And then they get looped. They get sucked into the rabbit hole like us. And then they'll buy our $100. They'll, they'll buy our $100. <laughs> That works amazing on every single type of And that's the thing. My husband's like, there has to be a way to make a sewing machine that's decent enough that'll last for, and that's the thing. It doesn't need to last forever, but if it lasts five years, you know, cool, you know. to make it last longer than five years. And that's the thing. Like, he's like, there's got to be a way to make a sewing machine that doesn't really need maintenance, you know. So we, if we could create a a cheap maintenance-free sewing machine, I think, I think we're there. And that, that could be the advertising benefit. The benefit is that you don't need to take this one in for servicing no. or like it's simple enough that if something does go wrong, you can like kind of fix it yourself or replace a part yeah. without, you know, kind of like some of the older sewing machines that exist where you could work on them more easily. Totally. I think we got some ideas here. We definitely have some ideas here. Now, so earlier you mentioned that when you go to hotels, sometimes you've got all your craft supplies in there. Oh, yes. Do you sew in the, do you sew in your hotel rooms a lot? Yes. I've done it. Spray paint, glue, hot glue, cut fabric, sew every anything I need to do for a segment or for a home show or for whatever it is. I'm I think that could be an interesting vlog series for your channel is um oh DI yeah. but like something like um what I'm doing right now in my, in my hotel. hotel yeah hotel hacks or something and then you're making stuff you're using stuff in the hotel room for crafting like the, you know, like the yeah like the plastic cups like you know the, the whatever like the soaps or something yeah. that actually would be a cool series you could show people how they can craft it could be good for busy travelers you know yes. Or if you're like, visit, if you go out of town to visit a friend and you forgot to bring a gift, you're like, what can you make in your hotel? Yeah, what, you so need to do that. I think that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Hotel, you call hotel hacks with Denise <laughs> and show people how to get creative in your hotel room. <laughs> totally well, fun. the people watching this are probably like, this is like the strangest I know. sewing chat ever, yeah. but yeah. we're having fun. Enjoying it, but uh, yeah, if but, not. Well, anyways, Denise, this has been wonderful talking to you, and I really appreciate you being here. I'm going to link what, where can people find you online, your website, social media handles? Yeah, I'm denisewild.com is my website, which I'm redoing this year. Very excited about it. 
Uh, and then on social at me, Denise Wild, D E N I S E W I L D. Wonderful. And yes, follow Denise. Her YouTube channel has some really great technique videos. You've got tutorials. You also post a lot of your TV appearances there so people can see what kind of stuff you're making. I do think you need to do an update on the, the rocking chair. That could be a future <laughs> I video. I haven't, I actually haven't, I think it's been like, oh my gosh, I don't even want to say, I think the last time I posted on YouTube was like March. I but you, you know what you, you and, and that's the thing you could do your oh, hotel awesome. hacks and that your business trips could kind of double as that too. There you go. I think that could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Things you can make in your hotel room. I <laughs> think people would, I think people would dig it. I would watch it and I don't even really stay in hotels. Before we have, before we go, I have questions for you. Okay. Yes. Sure. To ask and chat about. Okay. So, um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your song background. I know we've talked about this before, but I thought it might be nice to get into in this conversation. Is that okay? Or yes, that certainly. Weird? Okay. So I, um, I, my entire life, I've never really had anything I was really good at. I'm not athletic. Um, you know, I don't have any like special talents. That's why I work in T that's why I worked in TV news, um, is because I didn't have anything specific that I was really great at. Um, so I was, uh, I had just moved to Atlanta for the job at CNN and I was talking to my husband. I was like, you know, I would really like to do something. You know, we were living apart for a year too. So I had more free time that like I was kind of alone. Um, so he, somehow we got onto the topic of me doing sewing. I've done a little bit of sewing as a kid. Basically my background with sewing is I did take, my school actually did have a really good home act pro uh, program. Um, and we did, but the sewing machines we used were very finicky. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're a kid and you have, like you were saying, I had kind of a bad experience with the sewing machine. It really puts you off to doing it and you don't feel very comfortable with it. So I made, like, I was better with the hand sewing. Like we made like stuffed animals and stuff, but when it came to the sewing machine, I just had trouble with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing I would like to tell people who don't sew who might be watching is that. The sewing machines out now are bad, like they're easier to use. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing that surprised me about getting back into sewing was that the newer machines, the modern ones, you know, I didn't like the problems I had on the other sewing machines. I don't have with these. Yeah, um, really. So I started, I bought a vintage sewing, excuse me. I bought a vintage sewing machine from a guy on eBay and I went to pick oh, it up. Okay. eBay. Yes. Um, oh, could it, I was like, it was like $250 oh. for a vintage, but if what he does, like, so I went to this guy's house to pick it up. He was like a nurse who refurbishes sewing machines. Oh. And I, it's kind of a scary situation because as you know, with eBay and Craigslist pickups, yeah. it can get a little scary. I didn't get murdered, uh, so that was good. Um, you have to go into his basement and see like- No, what? yeah, it, the, the, I, and I was kind of scared. Like, I was kind of like, is this a good idea? Um, but you know, I was, I was okay. So he bought and refurbished a bunch of sewing machines and resold them on eBay. Yeah. But I think the thing with the vintage machine, the sewing machine is wonderful yeah. and it's great quality. It will last forever. Mm -hmm. But for me as a beginner, it probably wasn't the right machine to buy right off the bat mm -hmm. because I was afraid of using it because it was an antique. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, this is like a collector's item. Right. So it sat in like the bubble wrap for like six months. Yeah. I didn't do anything with it. But I watched, and that's the thing, like, I watched so many YouTube videos about it, but I, I didn't actually do it. Like, and that's how we are with a lot of things. Like I've watched a lot of cookie decorating videos, haven't ever decorated a cookie. Um, so I was one of those people, I was very curious about it and I was absorbing information, but it really took a while for me to really just start doing it. So my husband ended up finally getting down to Atlanta. He figured out the sewing machine and showed me how to use it. Um, so we, for a while we both sewed, he kind of went off it and started doing other things. Um, but he made a quilt and he made a pair of jeans. He made you me a purse. Jeans? Yeah, he made his own jeans, but the fabric he picked was like not the best fabric. Okay. Um, he didn't pre-wash it, so some of the seams came apart. But he did actually make his own jeans and he would Amazing. wear them. So he did a pretty good job with that. Um, so I started getting into it and then I started sewing and I really enjoyed it. So I've been doing it ever since. Um, and I, the reason I wanted to start the channel and do this was because I wasn't seeing a lot of people with my background sewing online. Like, I, you know, I'm not a mom. I, uh, you know, I was a professional at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just didn't see a lot of people I could relate to mm -hmm. that were also doing it. You know, a lot, and as you've seen, a lot of the bloggers in our space tend to be stay-at-home mothers. 
Right. You know, yeah. and again, I love mothers. I think right. being a mom honestly is one of the hardest things you can, one of the most challenging things you can do. And I have so much respect for them, but I just couldn't relate to that crowd. You know, I don't, I make clothes occasionally as gifts, baby clothes, but you know, I don't make kids stuff every day. Right. Um, so a lot of the projects are definitely more, right. a lot of the projects and just the language that they're talking to you, it's just meant for other moms. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted there to be more voices out there that have a different, just a different background or a different lifestyle. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that ever since. And I quit my job a couple months ago to, to do this. And it's been, it's been a fun ride. So uh, I love making things and I just like learning. Um, I have no formal background either. I just like learning things on my own and doing them, yeah. but it's, it's so much fun. And I've been trying to introduce it to more people um, and I'm, I'm just always thinking about ways that I can try to help spread the message. Yeah. I think that's so important for us is just spread the message that sewing is fun and approachable. Um, yeah. And I think I, I do feel like um, some, of, some of the, I feel like some of the folks in the sewing industry really have that same mission. Like that's why I started working with the Everson people was because the, the uh, Philip Bulci, the guy who, um, who is behind the brand he is very committed to reaching young people. And I want to reach, I really want to reach younger people and people who don't currently. sew. um, a lot, I th and I, and that's the other thing is I think a lot of the bloggers and bloggers I've seen are more marketed to people who already. sew, um, but there's not a ton out there for people who, who are just totally starting new for yeah. fresh. Um, so yeah, that's how I started getting into sewing. I love it. Um, yeah. And I, and I'm probably one of the least likely people to start sewing. Um, I'm not, I, as I mentioned, I'm not, I'm not that crafty. Like I like crafts, but I'm not that good at them. I'm not really an artist. Yeah. You know? And I don't like, that's not like, like my thing is to make stylized tablescapes. Like that's really not. Um, but I really felt like I could bring something to the sewing world that was made a voice that might be more approachable. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? That's amazing. You're doing amazing things. <clears throat> love the videos that you put out they're so informative and fun and I love it when you have like totally goofy stuff too I uh, yeah and I'm kind of an all weird person so I feel like it allows me to I love it express love some it. of the the weirdness um like right now you know <laughs> so uh, okay, one more question or a couple more oh questions. yeah sure so what tip or advice would you give to a newbie who wants to learn how to sew oh um definitely like you were saying earlier don't pick projects that are beyond your skill level sewing builds on so many techniques and layers that you really need to learn each technique and that takes you sewing to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing I see with people is that they try to pick projects that are really beyond their scope of knowledge at that point, And it can be very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, if your project doesn't turn out well, mm -hmm. you're not going to want to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also like, I think there are, I think there's a level of sewing machines, like I think there's a good happy balance. I don't think you should pick the super cheap machines, mm -hmm. but I also don't like, I don't know from doing it, I don't think most people need a $10,000 sewing machine. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I, I honestly think a $1,000 sewing machine is, can do a lot for you. For sure. um, you know, especially if you're not, if you are, if you're only making garments, mm -hmm. it, again, a, a lot of the more expensive machines are for quilters. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other thing is that you don't need a suit. You don't necessarily need a super expensive machine. You just need one that's decent enough right. that can grow with you a little bit. And I've seen some really good sewing machines that are under $300. Yeah. Um, so I think in my mind, I think a good price for a beginner would be between $150 and $300 US um, for a I beginner agree. machine. Totally. And it's scales up a bit in, yeah. in Canada. Like in Canada, I would tell somebody like <clears throat> to 600 but I agree with you uh, entirely about that price point. And like, like you said, you know, when you invest in a good machine, it's going to last you. Like I always say decades just to be safe, but really it'll last you a lifetime, but I'm just trying to cover my butt. And I think for, for, especially for us in like America and in North America, you know, for us, we, we almost expect something to last a few years. So I think that's another thing that sewing machines could do to consumers is, you know, like have, make a machine that lasts seven to 10 years. Yeah. And that would be totally cool with people, you know, that they could just get in because we are in this age of people just buy constantly buying new stuff. 
That's a good point. So if it is a hundred dollar machine, it doesn't necessarily have to last. For that's a time. lifetime. But if it like, uh, so we, and we, that's how we like, um, we were looking at blenders a few years back and, you know, there, there's some very nice Vitamix blenders and uh, Blendtec. We yeah, decided yeah, yeah. to go with like a Ninja and we're like, we you know what? Ninja too. yeah, so we have a Ninja and we also bought a generic version of the Vitamix, which is actually really great. Okay. We were, our thinking was, even if this lasts us a few years, we still spent way less than a Vitamix. Um, so I think that's my way of thinking things is, um, not necessarily buying the cheapest thing that will break, but buying something that's reasonably priced. Totally. Um, I'm pretty cheap overall. <laughs> I like shopping sales. Um, so if, I mean, if I can get a good deal on the nicest thing, I'll buy the nicest thing. But right. you know, sometimes not all of us have seven hundred dollars to spend on a blender, or mm. or ten thousand dollars to spend on the latest sewing machine. Yeah. Um, and and I've noticed with my sewing machines, I don't even use a lot of the features that it comes with. Um, like I, and I think the other thing I would tell people is if you're getting more into sewing, mm -hmm. I think in my opinion, it's better to have unitaskers that do different things than try to get a combo. So like if I bought an embroidery machine, I would actually prefer to have a separate embroidery machine because I don't like switching things out. Like I don't, I don't like switching out units or having to convert stuff. Um, I'm, I'm very lazy. As I mentioned, I'm very lazy. <laughs> so like yeah, very, <laughs> I, I know I'm making myself sound horrible right now, but, um, as far like, it needs to be really easy. Like I keep my surge on like the same settings, totally. you know, I don't like, I, I recently have just started playing around with different needles and it's not difficult, but at the same time, I just don't want to do it. Yeah. Um, so I'd rather have a separate embroidery machine set up so that, you know, I could do that. Okay. I have another question for you. All right. Shoot. <laughs> So do you have a favorite sewing trick or like an insider tip or anything like that? Or like a favorite stitch you like to do? You know, I would say, um, I, I, my trick would be Elmer's washable school glue. I use it to baste all the time. What? I learned it in a quilt binding class, okay, but I've been using okay. it for like everything. Oh, so, so I like will. Garments? Yeah. Oh yeah. Anything that's woven, that's mostly like natural fibers will work. It doesn't really work on like polyester, but it works. I um, I was taking a quilt binding class and this lady showed us, her name is Deb Karasik. And she, in the class, she gave us these little uh, squirt bottles with a fine tip. I still have the same bottle and I just keep refilling it with Elmer's washable school glue. It washes out. Um, the so only time white one, like the what, just the white, just the white glue. Yeah. And it has to be that glue because it's just starch basically. Okay. Um, so you can't, the only times I can't use it usually, or if I'm pressing the seams open, because right. obviously, you know, yeah. but if it's something where I'm just trying to base something together real quickly, I'll do that. And it works, right. it works really well. And, uh, it washes out and it saves you from using pins. What's, what's your favorite trick or tip? Gosh, well, I don't have anything that awesome. <laughs> so let me see. Well, I do have a good one for corners, for getting super sharp corners. You might know this already, but when you're sewing to like, um, instead of going like straight across and straight down, mm -hmm. if you stop one stitch before your corner and then angle it okay, so that you do like a stitch or two at an angle before going down so that instead of having like a perfect this, you have like a... I don't know. It goes like ring, ring, ring. Okay. So it's um, almost like a bevel, like almost like a bevel. That's sort of thing. Like, okay. Exactly. Like just one long stitch or two short ones. When you turn your corner out and poke it out, it's a perfect corner huh. because that extra space allows the fat, obviously clip down your, your extra, extra fabric, but there still is a little bit of allowance in there. Right. But that, that little flattened edge allows your fabric to lie in flat. So I love that. And right, I'm, I'm going to try that. Do that. You'll, your corners, you'll be like, Oh my God. Um, the other thing I always do is when I'm sewing, finishing sewing a button, I always hide the thread in the fabric. So if it's fabric layers, I'll bury the, um, the thread 
and make it exit like an inch or two away from where my button is. Then when you trim down that excess thread, it like disappears. So then you don't, that, that entire thread end is hidden between the two layers of your fabric. So it's not anywhere visible. I like that. And that's good because if you're making a shirt or something, there will always be a couple layers. Those are really good. All right. I'm going to have to try the corner tip. I have trouble with corners all the time. There you um, go. Or you'll have the corner where instead of going like this, it ends up like that. Like, you know. Oh, pointy. Like, it, it just, it, like, it's not, like, totally square. And, it, yeah, it just kind of ends up like, I don't know. No, that so that's something lot. else you need to do. You need to taper your ends in. Okay. So instead of, so when you're doing, like, a pillow, for example, right, to prevent the bunny ears, I'll send you a video. I did All right. So see, this is why you need to follow Denise on YouTube because she has all this, this knowledge. Oh, also, like for pillows to prevent the bunny ears. So instead of taking your corner like this, you, you bring your, your um, like apex or whatever down like an inch and then gradually angle oh. your, so that you're coming across straight. But then for about like four something inches, you bevel down. Okay. And then, and then bevel back out before going straight down. So you end up here. All right. This is like a sewing lesson right here. I like this. And that will prevent those, um, uh, the bunny ear corners. Oh my gosh. And I can't even draw. And you, I see you've got a really nice sewing machine next to you right there. And you're, are you still working with brother? I'm still doing a lot oh, of stuff right. So this is their um, dream machine. That's the top of the line brother dream machine. It's one of the 10,000, 12,000, depending on what country you're buying it from machines. But you're, you're a pro. So you're a pro. So that makes a lot. I am a pro, but I'm also sense. like very basic. I really don't use all of the amazing features that are on it. So I don't know if you can see that. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, okay. Yeah, so normally you would d like go out to the points but to prevent the bunny ears, come down an inch from that corner and then just have it like gradually angle out to your sides. And then when you flip your pillow, the, the, the corners will hug around your pillow form rather than being Yeah, those. rather than do it. Yeah, because that happens to me a lot when I'm making something. That is an interesting, all right. And I'll have to look for that video on your channel. You have so many great videos on there. And I just think more, I wish more people knew about your channel. There's there's so many good, there's so much, so much good information on there. I think it's great. And well, I, have, and now to, I have the pressure of, I need to upload. <laughs> oh, we can also, here's, here's the website, good thing. More videos. That's here's the good thing though. If people are discovering your, for your channel for the first time, they already have tons of content that's to watch. True. Oh, that's so true. Don't, don't feel too stressed out about it. You know, give, cut yourself up. And I think that's something that I wish, I think particularly this happens to women we get really over saying, you're right yeah we get really overloaded and we really i think we put a lot of pressures on ourselves you yeah. know and this goes back to what you were saying about trying to make everything perfect like i you know whether it's instagram or youtube or whatever like just feeling like well this needs to be my best self this needs to be my best whatever rather than just like sharing information sharing knowledge being yourself yeah, it's a really hard struggle, like in the day that we live in and, and as women, because we're like, ah, oh, it needs to be perfect. I am capable. I can do everything. Yeah. And I think we tend to overload ourselves with, with a lot of work and put a lot of these and like self-imposed deadlines or pressures on ourselves. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Well, thank you again so much for doing this. I, this has thank been a wonderful you. chat. Maybe we could do this again sometime. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. I love chatting with you, Jennifer. Thank you, you so too. much. You too. All right, Denise, so thank you guys. You've done, and I'm, I'm so honored to be here. Oh, well, I'm so glad to have you guys. If you enjoyed this sewing chat, let me know in the comments, and uh, give, feel free to give it that thumbs up. Let me know if you'd like to see more of these. I'm trying to find some cool people to talk to. Denise is one of my favorite people in the sewing community, so I am so honored to have her here with us. I will see you guys next time.